Good morning, folks. My name is Kalpin Modi from the White House Office of Public Engagement. I'm the President's Youth Liaison. We're here for uh, a web chat uh, on the EPA proposal for the first national standards for mercury pollution from power plants with Administrator Lisa Jackson uh, and a great group of uh, young folks from the advocacy community here at the White House. We're going to dive right into this. I'm going to let uh, Administrator Jackson make some opening remarks, and then we'll take your questions online. If you go to facebook.com slash White House, um, you can send us your questions, just post them on the, the White House Facebook wall, and we'll also take the questions from the, the folks in the, uh, the audience today. So let's get started. Thanks. Hello, hello everybody, and hello, everybody who's uh, listening in or watching online. It's uh, wonderful to be here. I'm uh, really excited. Yesterday was a wonderful day. No, not because I had my seventh congressional hearing in, <laughs> I think, two weeks or three weeks, but because we made a big announcement. Yesterday, EPA proposed new standards under the Clean Air Act, one of the bedrock laws in our country to address mercury and uh, toxic substances that come from power plants in our country. Now, I like to phrase this a little bit, frame it by talking about clean energy. All of you, many of you, certainly everyone in this room, have talked and advocated for and pushed for and believed in the president's vision of an energy future for this country that was clean. And I always say that much of the work of EPA, we're not the Department of Energy. We're the clean in the clean energy. We determine whether the energy that fuels our lives also keeps us healthy, or at least doesn't make us sick. Yesterday's proposal, a little bit in the weeds sometimes of the workings of the federal government, can sometimes get lost. So I want to give a tiny, tiny bit of history. I won't go back too, too far, but I bet I go back probably before some of you uh, were born. In the late 80s, actually probably starting long before that, people uh, began to envision the need to think about power plant emissions, the smokestacks. Uh, power plant emissions are, in general, the largest sources of air pollution from what we call stationary sources. There's cars, which we've been working uh, awful hard on. You all know about our clean cars work and our clean trucks and diesel work that's come out of this administration and the president's leadership. But then there's the things that don't move. And smokestack pollution is a big problem. And there's more to smokestacks than what we call conventional pollution, sort of the big ones. You think about soot. You think about smog. Some people call that ozone and its impact on health. You think about um, particulate matter. Uh, you think about carbon monoxide. All those are what we call conventional pollutants. But by the late 80s, we knew that that was just part of the dirty energy picture, if you will. The other problem were what we call toxic pollutants, oftentimes things that you know when you hear aren't good for you. Mercury, which is a neurotoxin, ends up depositing in waterways, stays fairly close to the communities, where it's uh, deposited. Some gets into the atmosphere, but a lot of it ends up depositing back into waterways is a neurotoxin, you know, specifically toxic to brain and brain development. So for pregnant uh, women, for young, young children, it literally can result in learning disabilities, lower IQ. Arsenic, which is a known human carcinogen. Acid gases, which I don't think sound pretty good, and I don't know that I have to explain to anyone, even those of you who aren't into chemistry, in terms of how they affect your lungs. They're either carcinogenic or can be quite problematic. Those are the standards that were incorporated into the 1990 Clean Air Act. So in 1990, Congress voted almost unanimously to amend the Clean Air Act to deal with the other uh, pollution in our air. The standards didn't get promulgated until yesterday. They were promulgated before uh, in the Bush administration and turned over by a court, found illegal because they traded pollution. And I'm not sure any one of us would want to be on the losing end of a trade that ends with mer more mercury in your community. So the standards that we proposed yesterday are still a proposal. They go through open public comment. But there's a couple things you need to know. They are based on technology that is achievable, primarily American engineered and innovated and built, and on use in almost half of the coal-fired fleet already in this country. These aren't pie-in-the-sky technologies to deal with mercury and acid gases and cadmium. They're on the, on the ground, in use today, right now. 
and they have another huge byproduct, an another benefit. They also end up dealing with fine particles, that which we call soot, some people call black carbon, very fine particles, which are killers. Most of the pollution we deal with makes you sick and over time, increases asthma attacks, means more heart attacks, means lung disease, means bronchitis. Particulate matter is a killer. We know it results in hundreds of thousands of premature deaths, and the rules yesterday address that. The standards that we uh, put out in proposal will be finalized by the end of the year or early next year. Then when they're finalized, companies have three years to put them in place. This is a pretty aggressive set of uh, standards under the Clean Air Act because these are pretty harmful pollutants. They can get an extra year, so three to four years. When they're in place, we estimate 17,000 premature deaths each year will be avoided. 11,000 heart attacks avoided. 120,000 asthma events avoided a year because of the pollution that won't be in our air. If that's not a huge part of the clean energy picture, I don't know what is. So I'll leave you with that thought, that I know you work and talk and think and hope to work someday in the clean energy space. Remember that what goes into the air, what goes into our water is what, or more importantly, what does it, is really what makes energy clean. Thanks. Thank you. I'm going to start with one question that I, I think we, we've seen a trend in, um, and then I think a lot of folks are wondering on the broader youth engagement piece which is, especially the last two years, we've seen incredible successes um, because of young people. So right. what's going on in Darfur, um, you know, what's happening or what happened with Don't Ask, Don't Tell, um, with healthcare reform, with student financial aid reform, certainly there's a lot more room to grow, but these are major, major successes that young people have fought for for decades to get done. This sounds like another one of those successes, so can you talk a little bit about the role that young people played, particularly youth advocates played, in, in, in helping move this along? Absolutely. Yeah, yeah you can't, it can't be overstated how important your advocacy was. Um, I, I think it is not an understatement to say it's this president, his administration's support for doing the right things by these rules. Remember what the president said in the State of the Union address this year. Listen, we're, we want smart, efficient, lean government, but we also want clean air. Americans have the right to, to clean air, all Americans, not just some communities. We want to continue to have our legacy of clean water. Many of you were lucky enough not to have to fight the fights to get the Clean Air Act passed, but believe me, you were instrumental in getting the Clean Air Act to be more than words on paper. It's wonderful to have a strong law, but without an administration, without a government that supports people's health. This is a public health statute that fights to ensure that reasonable investments are made. And by the way, you will hear lots of things about what these rules cost. They, they, this is an expensive rule that's gonna be implemented over time. EPA's models show that the health benefits are 10 times the cost. So for every dollar that's spent here in America, Hiring a worker, an engineer, a technician, an operator, a boiler maker, a pipe fitter, someone to do this work. There'll be 10 more dollars that someone doesn't see in avoided health care costs. That's, that's your legacy. And we, we take one day to look at the victories. I think this one deserves a lot more than that. Mm -hmm. So thank you all. Who's got a question for the administrator? No one wants to go first? <laughs> all right, I'll, I'll take an online one. I'm going to call on you in a second. Um, this was submitted online from a, a woman named Kate Bromley. Kate says, I would like to know how the Clean Air Act has created jobs which industries are responsible for, which industries are responsible for the most pollution, how much average it costs to retrofit the manufacturing plant with appropriate scrubbers, and what the resulting health benefits are. I know you talked a little bit about the latter two, um, but what about the job creation, which industries are, are uh, Sure. So let's talk about jobs for a second. Um, I've, I've written a little bit about this because the Clean Air Act is probably uh, underrated in its ability to stimulate our economy. We uh, hear a lot about trade, for example, how we need to export more uh, and import less, or at least export more than we import. That's our trade balance, right? We're a net exporter of pollution control technology. Part of the reason is because we've got 40-year-old laws like the Clean Air Act, the Clean Water Act. We've gotten pretty good in this country that if we know there's a, pro a pollution problem, 
be it ozone, be it mercury, be it uh, a drinking water issue, our engineers, our innovators, our scientists, our, our, our private sector develops solutions. And then the rest of the world says, hey, I'd like some of that too, and we sell that. We have an $11 billion surplus in environmental goods and services. So everything from scrubbers, which are the primary means of reducing SO2 pollution, uh, sulfur dioxide pollution in power plants, uh, to uh, selective catalytic reducers, which are sort of a version of the catalytic converters that are on every single automobile made in this country, are all exported, made and exported to other countries so they can use it on their power plants. You asked about what industries are affected. The rules yesterday affect the power industry, primarily uh, those power plants that burn coal or oil. Um, now, about 40 some percent of coal uh, fire power plants have already dealt with these rules. They saw them coming, they read the 1990 Clean Air Act like anyone else, and they made investments to clean up what comes out of their stacks. Um, all we're doing is suggesting that it is past time that we had a national standard so that everyone plays by the same rules and that in effect, those who have been putting off investing in their fleets don't continue to get a competitive economic advantage uh, as a result. Uh, we estimate that because these are phased in over time and because electric utility prices are determined by a whole range of issues, we're probably talking about three to four dollars a month, according to EPA's estimates, impact on utility bills, and it can be less. Who's got a question? Go ahead. Uh, so this is obviously a, a great step towards making these power plants healthy and healthier for our communities. But I think that this dirty and dangerous energy is dirty and dangerous from start to finish. So I'm wondering what the EPA is going to do to stop mountaintop removal and ensure that the extraction of this energy is also made more safe for our communities. That's a great question. So mountaintop removal, just I'm going to tell people what that is just in case everybody's not into that issue, uh, is uh, in parts of Appalachia. There is uh, coal mining, which essentially, uh, because a lot of Appalachia is mined out, they are going higher and higher up the mountain. So they use explosives, take the top off the mountain, essentially level it, recontour that space. And the concern we have, uh, uh, besides the fact that there's tremendous deforestation that happens as a result of that, is the impact that's now shown to be uh, happening on water quality. Scientists, peer-reviewed scientists, external journals, internal EPA scientists are coming to the same conclusion, which is that uh, because they dump all that residue into mountain streams, it's having an irreversible impact on the health of those streams. And it's sort of, you know, it's a bad, bad analogy, but it's sort of the canary in the coal mine. We're starting to see it now at the uh, ecosystem level with the critters that live in the stream, the salamanders and uh, small critters. But that is just the first step towards the degrading of what in many cases are pristine uh, streams. They're the, they're the beginning of the watershed as the water trickles down. Uh, when President Obama was elected, EPA had been, uh, had, has, has concerns, scientific concerns with the practice, but really hadn't been able to voice its concerns uh, or have them make a difference. These permits were being approved. Uh, EPA and the Corps of Engineers came together and said, hold, there are about 79 permits in process. We'd like to take another look at them because we believe the emerging science is showing that this is not a safe practice from a water quality perspective. Um, many of those permits have now withdrawn their application uh, and EPA has, has uh, worked with the Corps of Engineers on some that could be fixed and they've been approved because they, they're either not mountaintop removal or they're actually situations where they're going to use the process of mining to um, uh, leave the land in a position where it's not going to impact water quality. It, it's probably the easiest way I can say it. I think there's still three or four, three dozen or so permits that haven't been approved, but we've probably gotten the most notice uh, and some criticism in Appalachia, certainly in West Virginia, uh, for our veto of the spruce mine permit, which was, uh, many people who work on the issue know, had been hanging out there for a long, long time. It had been in litigation. EPA had commented on the permit multiple times, st did not, had never approved the permit. The Corps of Engineers approved it. In the last administration, it immediately went to court, 
And when President Obama was elected, uh, EPA reviewed that permit. And rather than defend a decision that we did not agree with, we exercised our authority, which were given under the Clean Water Act, to veto the permit. That is now in litigation. Thank you. Good question. Um, this one's coming from the Facebook wall. Greg R. wants to know, and several folks have said that they think this is a good question. Uh, and I don't know if this, if you saw the President's State of the Union, maybe this is a question for interior or commerce, but you talked about the salamanders, so I'm going to ask you about the fish. Um, after standards are in place four years from now, how long before the mercury pollution deposits reduce to acceptable levels in river and lake caught and farmed fish, and has this research even been done? There, there is some research done on uh, mercury's persistence in the atmosphere. Mercury is a PVT. It's a persistent bioaccumulative toxin. So that's, those are sort of as bad as you get um, in, in our world because it means it sticks around for a very long time and it accumulates up the food chain, which is why uh, um, uh, anyone uh, who's ever uh, either studied um, uh, medicine or maybe if you've uh, been around someone or had a child yourself, you know that one of the first things they tell you when you get pregnant is how much fish do you eat? Where does the fish come from? You have to be careful. And it's a problem around the world, not just in this country. It's not just fresh water. It's also in our oceans. And we do have some contribution of mercury that comes from uh, on the prevailing winds, if you will, from overseas. Mercury is uh, in the atmosphere. With all that said, EPA's uh, rule is premised on a couple of simple facts. One is that we can make interventions in mercury like this in a cost-effective manner that will show improvements, particularly in some of our freshwater areas where the primary source of the mercury is a power plant nearby. Overall, those are the places you're going to first be able to see some improvement over time. But please, again, remember mercury stays in sediments for a very long time. So although you're cutting off the source of mercury, it's been in the food chain for a long time. You're probably going to see uh, years and years to really see levels come down. I would argue that that is not a reason not to stop the continued deposition of mercury. But I wish, I wish ecosystems came back quickly. But a lot of our work at EPA is based on the premise and the knowledge that it's really hard to get an ecosystem back, to get that natural capital back once you've spent it. A question over here in the audience. Go ahead. Great. Thank you, Administrator Jackson. Um, obviously, this is a very exciting announcement, but as you alluded to, it took some 20 years from the passage of the Clean Air Act to get to today. Um, and I think those of us that understand that um, cleaning the environment and building a clean energy economy are urgent priorities and also understand we can't wait another 20 years. So my question is, what are some specific action steps that we can take to build on this exciting announcement today? And what's next? Well, first and foremost, get, you know, stay involved. What you're doing here is really helpful because you're understanding how all these pieces of the puzzle fit together. Um, this is just one thing that we're doing at one agency understanding the importance of clean energy. But when you look at it all together, it truly does add up. I saw an article not long ago in the paper, and it was commenting about um, the supply of oil, which obviously the world market on oil right now is causing a bit of chaos. And the article noted that domestic demand for oil is down. That's because of the president's clean car rule. That's exactly what the article said. And so, um, the reason I bring that up is that when we think about the energy picture, it's all kinds of things put together. It's how we generate our electricity, how we get around, how we uh, responsibly produce the domestic sources of energy that we have here, how do we think differently about renewables and get them out and into the marketplace. And I know many of you are really familiar with all the spending on research development and deployment of efficiency and technologies that this president uh, has uh, championed and, and stood up for uh, during his first two years and uh, certainly has continued to call for even in, in his budget uh, when he talks about investing in out innovating and in uh, infrastructure and in the technology that will help us win the future. So, I don't mean to minimize this announcement, it's huge. It's huge because if you think about it, um, most people are surprised to find that it's 2011 and we are just now making national standards for mercury pollution. So what that says is 
Those standards are going to be up for public comment, and we're going to uh, work to finalize them as quickly as we can. And then good news is they'll phase in fairly quickly. And my belief is that we'll see investments in our energy system, in our um, generation system, that will, will happen in response to this and other things that uh, the president's been planning for a long time. So this is just to help you understand one small piece of a much, much larger picture. We have a few questions on this topic, some a bit more cynical than others, but the topic is the same. So I'm gonna read, read two in particular. Okay. Um, Ralph Gentles is saying, if you're so concerned about mercury, why are you forcing CFL bulbs on us? How much mercury is going into landfills from these bulbs? And then another question on the same topic, bit more balanced perhaps, how do mercury concerns factor into the current debate in Congress over incandes incandescent versus CFLs in terms of looking out for young people, the life cycle and costs, mercury and GHG emissions, um, and how do we discuss these issues here and with Congress? Yep, okay, so when you think about mercury, just mercury, and these rules are about much more than mercury, and mercury and cadmium and arsenic, and acid gas and dioxin and all kind of toxic, but let's just focus on mercury. And because I'm an engineer, let me get wonky for a little bit and say how you define the problem, how you ask the question, has a lot to do with whether you get um, the facts, and facts really matter here. Okay, incandescent bulb, highly inefficient. The vast majority of the energy used in an incandescent bulb is wasted in heat, not in light. You don't get light from it, that's why they're very, very hot. Everyone, I think, accepts that as a scientific fact. CFL bulbs, uh, much, much more efficient, last much, much longer, have a tiny amount of mercury in them. So, like anything that contains a tiny amount of a substance, you can't be exposed to it unless it breaks. Humans do make mistakes, but just think about that. So, tiny amount of mercury over here. Let's go back to this incandescent bulb for a second. Okay, it's not running by itself. It needs power. You're plugging it in somewhere, whether it's a light fixture uh, or uh, uh, connected to the larger building, right? Where does that power come from? A power plant of some kind. There are all kinds of power plants. Some burn coal, some burn oil, some burn natural gas, some are nuclear, some are solar, some are wind, right? So. Since about 40 to 50, depending on whose numbers you use, of our domestic power comes from burning coal, much, much more mercury is ending up in our atmosphere, tons and tons, from plugging in an inefficient light, because you need so much more power to make it go, than if you buy a CFL, which is much more efficient, and you're careful with it. Now, if a CFL breaks in your home because it does have a small amount of mercury, please go to EPA's website or probably your state government's website and learn what to do to make sure you don't make that mer mercury volatilize. Essentially, you don't want to sweep it all over. You want to try to vacuum it up and get it up and then dispose of it, and there are guidelines for that. But if you're really going to ask the question about mercury, you can't compare the amount of mercury in a bulb uh, with uh, an incandescent. You have to look at the process and understand that when you talk about which lights you choose, that's a matter of efficiency. When you talk about emissions from a smokestack that are totally controllable with current technology, all we're asking utilities to do is make the investment. And guess what? Many of them already have, so it's not impossible. Uh, I've seen utilities do it, and I've seen their rates actually uh, go down after they've invested in cleaning up their emissions. Utility means useful and good. And Dirty air is not useful, and it's not good. Take another audience question. Um, why don't we, oh, you're over there. All right, go for it. Thank you. Administrator Jackson, just first, thanks so much for your excellent leadership on these environmental issues. We really appreciate it, and all of your support for the environmental movement in general, such as coming to Power Shift next month. We really appreciate that. But then moving forward, you talked earlier about these, this new announcement saving tens of thousands of lives every year. Given that that is such a pressing dilemma, can we count on the Obama administration and Obama himself to veto any attempts or attacks on the Clean Air Act or on the EPA's authority to regulate greenhouse gases in general? Thanks. Well, you know, I was uh, thrilled. I was walking into the announcement for uh, this proposed rule yesterday, and I read the White House spokesman's statement on current efforts right now on Capitol Hill to remove uh, to gut the Clean Air Act, to change the Clean Air Act, to take greenhouse gases out of the mix. 
So this rule doesn't, this proposal doesn't address greenhouse gases, but it addresses many of the plants that are the largest um, contributors to greenhouse gases on the stationary side, that being power plants. In our world, in our country, the big emitters of greenhouse gases are power plants, cars and trucks and vehicles, and then other um, uh, uh, uses, including manufacturing uses, but power plants and, uh, and refineries, and then other uses. So uh, let's think about it. When you have cars and trucks, because of the president's leadership, because of efforts that spanned all stakeholders, we actually control greenhouse gases emissions in cars and trucks. We're doing it in a very cost-effective way, one uh, that increases the fuel efficiency of those cars and trucks encourages innovation and investments in everything from the air conditioning systems to the braking systems so that you can have choice in the kind of car you buy, but we're bringing down the amount of fuel that we need. We're breaking our oil addiction. So we're looking at that sector. We've made progress. Here's the power sector. And here's the Clean Air Act waiting to help start to get started on making that sector more efficient, to making it look at cutting greenhouse gas emissions when it makes big investments. The Clean Air Act is very good at that. I, I like to say it's not going to change things overnight. 1990 to 2011, I'm not going to sit here and tell you things change overnight, but they have changed. Air pollution in this country has gone down over 40 years of the Clean Air Act, 20 years of the amendments to the Clean Air Act. It can happen again. Yesterday's statement by the White House was that the president does not support and is against any effort to gut the Clean Air Act so that polluters have absolutely no restrictions on the amount of carbon pollution that they put into the air. If this happens, there will be absolutely nothing that our power sector, one of our very largest sectors of greenhouse gas pollution, will have to do. It will be unchecked, unreined in. And I don't think that makes a whole lot of sense, especially since all, most of the requirements that we're asking them to look at, uh, in fairness to them, you can't control greenhouse gas emissions at the stack. The technology is not there yet, but you can be efficient. You can do what we do with the light bulbs. You can say, I can make my boilers more efficient. I can find ways to use my steam in combined heat and power plants. I can find opportunities to squeeze every bit of energy out of the fossil fuel that I do have to burn, whatever that fossil fuel might be. And of course, I can invest in renewables, which is a good thing. Thank you, good question. Mm -hmm. So two more, uh, these are more sort of state focused. Um, Rick Don uh, and Car uh, Carolyn Collier are asking two separate questions on a related topic. Rick wants to know, can you comment on the proposal for copper mining in northern Minnesota and the elimination of EPA regulations? And similarly, on the state level, Carolyn wants to know, why doesn't every state have mandatory emission testing? And how much are we on board making new energy like solar now? Well, let me start with Carolyn, because Rick, I'm going to have to get your contact information and have uh, somebody email you back uh, some details on uh, the copper mining. I know there's been uh, a couple of specific cases, one I'm aware of, I think it's in Minnesota on tribal land, has to do with some tribal resources, but I don't think uh, there's much e EPA jurisdiction there. But rather than give you bad information, why don't That's we get That's fine, Rick's and, and I'll give you all a, an, uh, an email address and a website at the end so you can stay in touch with us. So That'd be great. Rick, stay and tuned for that. So Rick, yeah, we, we'd like to get your answer. Um, for Ms. Collier, Carolyn, uh, you're asking about emissions tests. Every state in the country, does have to do emissions testing as part of, guess what, the Clean Air Act. Most states run the Clean Air Act for the federal government. So if you happen to decide to open a business um, someday in the near future and you need a permit, you're going to apply to your state permitting authority more than likely. It's not going to be an EPA permit that you need. And part of what the Clean Air Act requires is that states set up a system of monitors to determine the general health of the air, whether they're in attainment for federal standards for smog, are they in attainment for federal standards for carbon monoxide, are they in attainment for federal standards uh, for fine particles, all those things we've been talking about. So there are monitors out, and if you go to EPA's website, uh, you can look at where the monitors are in your state. You can uh, uh, click on our website, go to our AIR website, and look under monitoring and find those monitors, and then it'll probably link you to your state website so you can see that. 
Carolyn, you might have been asking about greenhouse gas emissions testing. And there, uh, it is now uh, required that all large emitters of greenhouse gases report their emissions annually to the EPA. And then we put that uh, 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 information out as well. I have to say, there are some efforts in Congress, this one really blows my mind, to stop just reporting on greenhouse gases. Uh, knowledge is certainly uh, the first step to understanding the, scopes of the, prob the scope of the problem we face. Lots of folks are able to uh, uh, know what their greenhouse gas emissions are, because if you don't monitor it, you can calculate it simply by knowing how much fuel you use. It's a pretty simple uh, calculation. And so we're hopeful that uh, that doesn't uh, uh, um, become uh, the law of the land, because I think we uh, work so hard to get a reporting rule that doesn't put a huge burden on businesses, but gives the public the right to know where greenhouse gas pollution is happening and frankly, where we're making progress and where we're not. Great, thank you. We had a question from a young lady over here, I think. Just um, give us a second, we'll bring the microphone around so the folks at home can hear you. Good morning. Um, my name is Sasha Jones, and I come to you by way of Atlanta, Georgia, at Spelman College. And so Atlanta is, is interesting in the sense of its water, um, and we have kind of some interesting um, problems. So my question is, how does this new announcement address the other private sector um, industries, such as the bottled water industry, in terms of pollution and in terms of regulating what's actually in our water? And also, how does this um, announcement plan to address those environmentally despaired communities that have not typically been addressed um, in terms of the Clean Air and Clean Water Acts and other regulations in the past? Thanks, thanks. So this announcement doesn't, it's a Clean Air Act announcement. So to the extent that what's in the air deposits into our water, mercury is a great example of that, there will be some benefits for our rivers, our lakes, and our stream. For people uh, who love to fish, who love to eat, seafood, all those things, there are benefits there. But EPA has a huge portfolio of work, which is much more directly um, related to a lot of the, the issues in your question. I'll give you just a few things off the top of my head that uh, EPA is working on. Uh, in Atlanta, uh, uh, certainly one of the issues has been uh, how we handle wastewater, um, sewage, basically. And like many, many older cities, the, the, including Washington, D.C., sort of the state of practice 100 years ago when cities were building their infrastructure or more was you had storm water when it rained and you had sewage water from people's homes or businesses. And when the system got taxed, you just combined all that and raw sewage flows into our waterways. Atlanta is to be heralded, um, to be congratulated, because they've taken a leadership role on trying to address that issue. It is now against the law to discharge raw sewage that way, but the federal government understands that you can't just change hundreds of years' worth of infrastructure overnight. So Atlanta, like many cities, has a federal uh, consent decree to address separate, not separating, but addressing uh, raw sewage, ensuring that it doesn't enter waterways. Uh, when it rains. That's a huge issue and one to be commended for. The other thing that's really neat about Atlanta is, of course, that it's a growing and developing metropolis with lots of stormwater issues that come along with that. The stormwater is not neat, but Atlanta uh, is certainly uh, growing leaps and bounds. So whether it's the rainwater that comes off the highway system, the rainwater that comes off of uh, urban and suburban development, all those issues are being dealt with um, by the city as part of an integrated planning process that looks at what we call point sources, pipes, and runoff pollution uh, as well. And EPA is working pretty hard uh, with Atlanta on that. Of course, Atlanta had the drought, another uh, uh, good example, several years ago. And so I think one of the things that came out of that was an understanding of the need to conserve water and understand uh, Atlanta's place in the watershed, especially when it talk, talk about states that are down downstream of Atlanta who felt uh, that they were going to be suffering if there wasn't um, an abundance of water. Last but not least, EPA understands that just like with the Clean Air Act, the key to the world's water problems, and the world will have water problems as the climate changes, um, is going to be innovation. We have to find cost-effective, sort of sustainable solutions to deal with delivering clean water to everyone. Certainly everyone in our country, that's EPA's job, but again, we'll be exporting the technologies we use here 
because much of the developing world, I just got back from a trip to Africa a few weeks ago, my very first uh, time to the continent, much of the developing world is looking to us and our entrepreneurs and our businesses to help them as they watch their climate change and watch water as such a stressor in their communities. So EPA's lab in Cincinnati has a water innovation cluster. Actually, there's work going on at Spelman, you may well know about it, around water and an innovation uh, hub of activity that's going on around the AU Center and uh, the campus down there. There's several prop, uh, popping up around the country. And, uh, it's really cool because private sector investment is, inv is, is, is right there because they see the opportunities to make money out of the world's growing need for clean water. Great. How are we on time, Nikki? Good for a couple of questions? Okay, so we have one more it's here only from... easy ones. Easy ones? <laughs> this one is pretty straightforward because I know you talked about it a little bit. Uh, Patrick Parrish wants to know, uh, how is this announcement, your announcement yesterday, how is it supposed to bring jobs back to America and is there a provision for removing fluoride and uranium reported to be in the water in certain areas? Oh, okay. So how does it work for jobs? And then we'll do the uh, uh, uranium and fluoride issue separate. Um, it, it's good for jobs because I want you to think about the power sector. You always, we hear a lot about our jobs being exported overseas, about manufacturing just getting up and leaving. Okay, the one, people, the one sector that can't go anywhere with our 300 million people is the power sector. We need power here. We need power to run our homes and our businesses. We need affordable power. One of our strategic assets as a country is that we do have uh, an abundant supply of affordable power, affordable for most people. Certainly in these times, uh, utility bills, we'd all like them to be lower, but we are, are blessed in this country to have it. What we're doing is saying, let's invest. It's, it's, it's an infrastructure investment, if you will. Our power system is old. Many of the oldest coal-fired power plants date back to the 30s and the 40s and the 50s, before anybody thought anything about a Clean Air Act or understood the direct correlation between how much mercury is in the air and what that means for levels in fish and what that means for our blood, le blood levels of mercury. So what we are doing is requiring, through updated Clean Air Act standards, investments in public health. Those investments will play out in scaffolding that you will see around uh, power plants, where now CEOs and uh, if they're uh, uh, municipally owned utilities will need to look at their fleet and say, OK, this plant's not going to make these new standards. What investments need to be made? There's been lots of questions about whether that means these requirements necessitate a switch from one fuel to another. Some people have said, well, do, does this mean everybody has to get off coal? No, it does not mean that. If you're burning coal, coal has its own concerns from a greenhouse gas perspective, but coal can be controlled at the stack for mercury and these other gases. So you need to invest in the plants that are out there to bring them up to speed. There, there are other uh, rumors out there. Well, that means people are just going to shut down huge amounts of, po of power plants, and we're going to have uh, concerns there. Our modeling shows that that's not going to happen. Some companies, some CEOs, some um, uh, managers may look at their fleet and say, well, this 30 1930s, 1940-era's plan, it really can't be invested in, right? It's, it's lived its life. The metal's going. The, the rivets are about to blow anyway. I've always been concerned about X, Y, or Z. So they may make a decision that this one is not one that they're going to put any more money in. In those cases, there are huge opportunities to um, uh, deal with the actual surplus of generation capacity we have in this country right now. In some cases, newer, cleaner units aren't being run because older, dirtier ones can be run more cheaply and they've not been required to clean up. So that's what we think is going to happen. Now, how does that play out in jobs? Remember those pipe fitters and boiler makers and riveters and laborers, all of whom are going to be called in to do everything from poor new construction pads to build um, the scrubbers or other uh, devices that will take these pollutions, these toxics out of our air. Those are jobs here. They can't be shipped overseas. And the other question was about water and fluoride and I think uh, uranium. I'm not quite sure where uh, uh, the concerns are. Fluoride came up, comes up uh, from time to time because EPA has announced 
that it's going to uh, lower the standard in drinking water for fluoride. You know, many systems in this country add fluoride to their water. The Centers for Disease Control says it's one of the most important health innovations uh, that uh, uh, those systems can make. But because so many people drink water from so many sources, including uh, in drinks, <laughs> I don't want to name any trade names, that wouldn't be fair, but you know all the things you buy and drink uh, these days, and they have fluoride in them, and you have fluoride in your toothpaste, and there's fluoride in water at home. What's uh, the National Academy of Sciences and uh, uh, CDC and EPA have agreed that EPA should lower the level in drinking water in residuals there because Americans seem to be getting the, what they need from a combination of sources. Great, thank you. Who's uh, got a question from the audience? All right, go ahead. Um, thanks, as a nation we do get a lot of our um, energy sources from coal, um, but coal is dirty and it's expensive and it's harmful. Um, and so what is the EPA doing to shut down coal-fired power plants? Um, I always say that EPA is not against coal. We're against coal pollution. That's our job. We are the Environmental Protection Agency. We are not uh, chartered anywhere uh, to bring our uh, expertise to bear anywhere, but on what's in our air, what's in our water, what's in our land. So um, what, what rules like this are about are addressing what's in our air from our power sector. And it is true that um, Actually, coal is a fairly cheap fuel to buy. It's why there are so many of our baseload power plants that, are, that burn coal. It's cheap to buy and burn, but the costs of pollution are borne by all of us. So it's sort of an externality in our system that if somebody pollutes, if they're doing it in compliance with all the regs on the book, all the standards, you can't get mad at them. They're following the law. So what this proposal is about is saying it's time, it's high time from a public health perspective that we have national standards and strong ones, not ones that are sort of uh, meant to allow most people not to do anything. We're, we're requiring people that if you, tend to, if you intend to burn coal or oil, these are the standards that are allowable in air and they're achievable and they will reduce 90 plus percent of the total mercury that comes from burning coal out of our air. We'll ne we will not have to deal with that uh, uh, because of these standards. That's the way EPA must and should deal with these issues, not based on whether or not we like it, but what the law tells us to do. When it comes to coal, the other areas that where EPA has significant work ongoing, you heard about uh, mountaintop removal mining. Um, we certainly uh, work very closely uh, on a number of issues that uh, have to do with water quality around mining in general, but that's the one that most people um, are familiar with us on. Uh, there's also what happens to the ash, the coal after it's burned. EPA proposed the first ever national standards for uh, regulating that ash after the terrible tragedy down in Tennessee um, where you know, we saw billions of tons of it uh, in waterways, that cleanup continues. So uh, we have not finalized those standards, but we are committed to having national standards for coal ash uh, because you do need to look at the life cycle of coal. And of course, last but not least, from the greenhouse gas pollution side, again, these plants have absolutely no check on the amount of carbon, carbon dioxide pollution that they can emit. I think you can use the Clean Air Act sensibly. You're not going to see some overnight where all of a sudden everybody says no coal. You're going to first see uh, a, a rigorous insistence on efficiency, on looking at efficient plants. All right, so we've got a couple minutes left. Um, we'll leave one question here from the online audience that several folks have asked, which is about uh, the really tough uh, fiscal and budgetary situation. I guess it's best uh, summarized by Dan Cannon's question. The new mercury rules will presumably require the EPA to have appropriate funding so they can do their job regulating and making sure corporations are following these rules. So what is the Obama administration doing to protect the EPA budget cuts? Okay. So I think uh, Dan's referring to the fact that the uh, House Resolution 1 
that passed had a 30% cut to EPA's budget, just uh, off the top, uh, pretty, uh, pretty draconian, pretty huge cuts, and then had nine or 10 riders, uh, policy riders in a budget document that uh, intended to tie EPA's hands in reining in various types of pollution. Uh, obviously, we are part of a much larger bar budget discussion, and probably the best way to answer that question is to talk about the President's proposal for EPA's 2012 budget, because it shows the environment that we're in, which is, um, as a manager of a large agency, not a huge one compared to other ones, uh, I should point that out, but we have about a, a $10 billion budget, uh, and that, that budget about half of it, maybe more, actually goes out to the states. Remember, the states run the program, so it goes out to them to run air and water programs uh, and to fund Superfund cleanups and brownfield cleanups and water infrastructure, investments in sewage, investments in drinking water plants, really investing uh, in infrastructure. That said, the President's 2012 budget proposed a 13% cut to EPA's budget. Now, you have to put that in context. The President proposed the largest EPA budget increase in history in his first budget. Uh, and so most of that money went to things like the Great Lakes cleanup, water and sewage investments, investments in brownfields, investments in Superfund. So we are cutting back some of the increases that the president proposed because we understand that Americans are tightening their belts and EPA is not exempt from that. What I say is that my job as EPA administrator is to squeeze every drop of environmental protection out of every one of those dollars. But my job is also to speak up and raise my hand when I believe the cuts are at a level that are gonna impact public health. It's just like uh, a visit to your doctor. I am not a doctor. I would not presume to be a public health, uh, uh, a medicine, uh, medical doctor, but it's the same. It's my job to say whether or not cuts will impact the health of Americans because air gets dirtier and water gets dirtier. And my belief is the president's budget is a reasonable uh, trim. There are some tough cuts in there. There are cuts to water infrastructure investments, but they're based on the knowledge that the president made a huge investment in water infrastructure in the Recovery Act. Uh, his choice, a huge investment in diesel emissions in the Recovery Act. We got more money for Superfund and Brownfields. So we're saying, okay, we can take, a, in a tough budget year, we can take some of that money off the table. But if you start cutting into EPA's core programs, our enforcers, our inspectors, the money we give to states to write permits to do their enforcement work, if you start to cut into those funds in a drastic way, I have to raise my hand. And so for that reason, I support the president's budget. But I think that um, what we saw uh, in the, the um, House Republican efforts is very dangerous. Thank you. I know that we're, we're out of time for questions. There are folks online who are, some are frustrated we didn't get your questions. Others are giving you a lot of love. So I want to make sure you know that. Um, for, folks, <laughs> for folks whose questions we didn't get to, uh, you know, a lot of them were local or community in nature. Some of them were international. Uh, some of them had to do with state regulations. There is a way for, uh, for you to make your voices heard here with us at the White House. If you go to whitehouse.gov slash young Americans, uh, there's a toolkit there you can download to host your own roundtable on all the great issues that you raised with folks in your community. Send us that feedback and somebody will be in touch with you. So that's whitehouse.gov slash young Americans, especially the gentleman whose question you didn't get to answer. If you want to uh, shoot us a message through the, the interface there. And invite EPA. We'll come. We, we're, we'll come. Yeah, the president uh, has promised that the administration is <laughs> going to do at least 100 of these. So if you, <laughs> you want to request folks at the EPA, please, please go for it. Um, their website also, epa.gov. We're at whitehouse.gov. And the youth website is whitehouse.gov slash young Americans. I want to thank everyone online for joining us, everyone in the audience here from the advocacy community, and, of course, Administrator Jackson. Thank Thanks, you so much Cal. for joining us. Thanks for us. doing this. Thanks Absolutely. to the White House. Thank you all. Take care.